Okay, so um, good evening, everyone. My name is Ross Sawyers. I'm the chair of the photography department here at Columbia College Chicago. And I wanna welcome everyone to the third installment of the lectures in photography series for the fall of 2020. Uh, the lectures in photography series is co-presented by the Museum of Contemporary Photography and the photography department at Columbia College Chicago. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, uh, I want to take a moment to thank Natasha Egan, Karen Irvine, Kristen Taylor, and the rest of the staff at the Museum of Contemporary Photography. This lecture series would not be possible without their collaboration. I also want to thank Kelly Connell, the, direct, the graduate program director in the photography department at Columbia College. Her behind the scenes work on this lecture series is invaluable. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Mimi Plum. Mimi was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area. She received her MFA in photography from the San Francisco Art Institute, and her photographs are in the collections of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Los Angeles, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Pier 24, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the Dow Museum of Contemporary Art, and the Yale University Art Gallery, to name a few. She is a 2017 recipient of the John Gutman Photography Fellowship and has received grants and fellowships from the California Humanities, the California Arts Council, the James D. Phelan Art Award in Photography, and the Marin Arts Council. Her book, Landfall, published by TBW Books in 2018, is a collection of her images from the 1980s. Plum's second book, The White Sky, a memoir of her childhood growing up in suburbia, was recently published by Stanley Barker. So please join me in welcoming Mimi Plum. And before I hand this over to Mimi, I just want to ask if you have questions, please feel free to enter them into the Q&A. Um, and I will moderate the question and answer session after, uh, after the lecture. So without further ado, Mimi Plum. Hi, everybody. Um, it's a little bit like I'm talking to myself here, but I'm sure I'll get used to it as I go through this presentation. Um, today, I'm going to show you my personal history in photography. And uh, this will only actually take us up till the early 2000s. Um, but there's about five projects that I did prior to that time from about 1970 to, to again, the early 2000s. So that's what I'm going to show you today. Um, I am a California based artist. So just about everything I'm showing you, almost all the pictures are from California and, you know, sort of the states surrounding it. But I'd say again, you know, I just assume that people know this, but not everybody does necessarily. So uh, this first series I'm going to show you was shot almost entirely in the San Francisco Bay area. Um, so I'll start there. I was born in Berkeley, but raised in the California suburb of Walnut Creek. In 1971 at 17, I moved to San Francisco to study photography at the San Francisco Art Institute. I liked photographing on the streets. Deeply moved by the photographs of Diane Arbus and Robert Frank, their somber view of an America that I saw on my daily treks throughout the city. To paraphrase Joan Didion, I photograph to find out what I'm thinking, what I'm looking at, what I see and what, I, what it means. This photograph was actually taken when I was 18. So it was right when I started the Art Institute as an undergrad in 1972. One of my earliest photo teachers, John Collier Jr., a protege of Dorothea Lange, he encouraged me to engage in more in-depth long-term projects and was a mentor for a project I did in the 1970s about growing up in suburbia. This work was recently published by Stanley Barker and it's called The White Sky. I call this my childhood memoir. The images were made when I was 18 to 25. In this series, I simply wanted to record where I came from and how I felt to grow up there. These pictures were made in various suburban communities surrounding San Francisco. Back then and today, it was the land of smoke and fire and drought. The starkness of the landscape hurt my eyes. The low brown hills coated with dry grass, scratching my ankles, foxtails caught in my socks. I was always looking for a place to hide from the bright white sky. The raw dirt yards and treeless streets, model homes expanding exponentially with imperceptible variation. Suburbia was the landscape of my childhood. At 13, we wore faded 501 jeans torn at the knees. 
tight white t-shirts, long straight hair. I have to stop there a second. If you look at me now, I haven't changed much since, since I was that age. Um, anyway, tight white t-shirts, long straight hair parted down the middle. I will also insert this now too. When I photograph the fairs now, um, you know, in the past few years, I still go back to the county fairs and make pictures. The girls still look the same. They have the long straight hair parted down the middle. Um, yeah. So where was I? We wandered around. So long straight hair parted down the middle. We wandered around the Walnut Festival, hiding in corners, smoking cigarettes, looking for stuff to do. The Haight-Ashbury counterculture existing no less than 20 miles from my suburban enclave, along with the anti-war and civil rights movement, called out to us, standing in sharp contrast to the bland uni uniformity of life in the suburbs. So I'm gonna show you, you know, a lot more work from this series. Um, and this is now what's coming up is an edited version of the new book, The White Sky. And I'm gonna show you that because it's kind of a well curated journey through the images and the community that I grew up in. So this first picture is the cover of the book. Um, then we head into uh, just this scene, which is actually slightly north of San Francisco. Um, this is called Goat Rock. This is probably about 1975. It's a motorcycle rally, Sears Point. So one of the things in my suburban neighborhoods, at least, is that we often have Jehovah Witnesses. It's a religious group um, who would frequently knock on the door and they were selling their Bibles and wanting to talk about their religion. And this is a close up of uh, two Jehovah Witnesses. This is father and sons at the circus. Train town up in Santa Rosa. A young boy with a peppermint candy in his hand. Smiling beauty queen, Thurin County Fair. And then this picture is repeated except she's no longer smiling. And this is where the book sort of takes a turn. So, you know, you have these introductory photographs of these typical suburban scenes. And then it does this weird thing, which, um, you know, came about through collaboration with Stanley Barker as, as we were working to put this book together. So it goes into two, two black pages where it says the on the right hand side. And then this picture, and this is a young boy. He's reaching up into the sky. He's at a shopping center in San Anselmo, California. Um, but what you don't really see in the picture is that he's reaching towards a fire in the hills. So um, that's why he's, you know, kind of standing like that and, you know, obviously very intense and, and excited or, you know, fearful, whatever it might be that he's expressing in his body. And this is what it looks like in the book. And then another double page spread of black where then it just says white. And then this picture, which is another picture from the same scene. And this is at the Safeway Shopping Center. And they're also responding to the fire in the hills. Another picture, you know, a double page spread that says sky. And this really kind of mimics um, you know, a movie script titling. And I think that's really what Stanley Barker had in mind when they suggested this as a possible way of, of presenting the work. And then, you know, the, the, the standard picture of a gas station in California, a standard gas station with a couple in the foreground. And this is how it looks in the book. So then after that picture of the standard gas station is Mimi Plum. And then the book shifts again into really a description of the landscape. Um, so this is Lake Nicasio, the watershed for Marin County where I was living at the time. And this was 1976. And there was a major drought in California actually referred to as the Dust Bowl drought. Extreme water rationing in a number of months, for a number of months. For instance, we had to fill bathtubs with water daily in order to have water to flush the toilet. Um, 
Yeah, it was, you know, we'd fill up in the morning, we'd, we'd fill up uh, large containers with, with water so that we could have water throughout the day. So, you know, fire and drought was really part of my life back then, or something I became very aware of back then. Um, and then looking at California history, the land of smoke and fire, it was referred to that 100 years ago. And um, what I was really looking to do in this series was describe, again, this constant kind of um, construction, you know, the tearing down of the old, old homes and the building of the suburban neighborhoods. And again, how that looked and how it felt to me as a kid. So this is just along one of the, one of the roads east of Walnut Creek where I grew up. Um, it's along Highway 101 in, in Marin County. It's a family vacation. This is my um, ex-husband. Two horses and the concrete rebel. Shell refinery. I shouldn't say shell refinery. I'm not sure what the name of this refinery is, but an oil refinery. And then this picture, which, which does show up on the cover. So this isn't the same mansion that, that you saw earlier. Um, it's another one that was just along the road that I passed frequently uh, in the 1970s. It was still there actually in the 80s, even though in the 70s, you know, with these mounds of dirt, it looks like it's about to be torn down. Um, and I didn't realize this until I was scanning the work just a few years ago that I had this picture and that this picture actually was a young girl peering through the windows in this house. So she's looking through plastic and there's that skeleton of a television set, you know, in the foreground and that rusted tricycle. I kind of felt like, I wish I had, you know, learned a little bit more about her, hoping that she's okay. Looking at her now, I just wonder about, was she okay? This is the quintessential California landscape that I grew up in. And this is really what it looks like right now too. We still haven't had much rain. Everything is really dry. Um, temperatures in the 60s. Today it was 66 degrees out, you know, beginning of December. So this is the ubiquitous suburban swimming pool, except, you know, symbolizing the best of California living. But um, this is a swimming pool after a fire ran through the property. This is still the same period of time, time, 19, mid 1970s. And then a close up of the chimney that, that you see in the background here. And sprinkled throughout the book are pictures of teens and kids, at times seemingly running wild. This is a coyote on a picnic table. People ask me about this picture a lot. I was that close. You know, he was tired and hungry though. That's, I didn't think he was really, it's hard to say. I didn't really feel at the time threatened by him. I felt really bad for him. Um, reservoir with very little water. This is a uh, Sears Point, the kids playing in the tires. I don't know exactly where this picture was taken, but you know, an upside down car in the middle of town. And then these next two pictures are a spread that I'll show you in its book form too. This is um, for me a picture that means a lot because she really does uh, symbolize I think my time as a young teenager, I, I was smoking back then. Um, this is at the Walnut Festival, which I used to go to when I was that age. 
And, you know, this is maybe 10 years after I had been at the Walnut Festival, but things still looked pretty much the same. And, you know, there was just, I, I think of when I was growing up, there was just, there were just areas throughout the neighborhood, you know, which is just dirt mounds where they're gonna build new houses. And this is where the kids played. Two young boys at the Walnut Festival. This is also from a, a fire that was up in the hills. Um, a flea market. This is actually a replica of the state capitol, um, the California state capitol. And I think it was from a miniature golf course and it was just sitting out like this, dilapidated in the middle of a field. This is really quintessential California housing. Halloween. I don't know if you all have ever seen granny dresses, but that was uh, sort of a popular thing in the 1970s. So we're getting towards the end of the book here. This is a, another spread that's in the book. Most of the pictures in the book are single page, but some of the spreads, um, it, there are some spreads in there that are, I think, really, really well done. So these are the last three pictures in the book. Um, for me, the resonance is both eerie and meaningful in how the pictures I made earlier in my life are pertinent to the moment we're living through now. And this is something I wrote in August. Of the land of fire and drought that I photographed in the 1970s today is ablaze, with 28 major fires burning throughout the state. As I look outside my window in Berkeley, California, the sky is orange and we are in day 25 of unhealthy air quality due to the smoke. The American dream as embodied in the California suburbs is imperiled by a climate in crisis. To quote from a recent article from the British Journal of Photography, the question of sustainability sits at the heart of the work. Despite being shot almost five decades ago, references to suburbia's fraught relationship with the environment surrounding it are central. And perhaps the unsustainability of suburbia is emblematic of the unsustainability of the American dream, a social, environmental, and political issue which is more pressing now than it was when Plum made these images. So this is the last picture in the book. This is the uh, back cover. And this is a picture of me when I made these pictures. So this is, you know, sometime mid seventies, long straight hair parted down the middle. It's hard to laugh, but just, Kind of makes me laugh now at, in my 60s looking at this picture and looking at how certain things just have not changed. Um, anyway, so this next series is something completely different. Um, and I'm still actually, this series was also made while I was an undergrad at the San Francisco Art Institute in the 1970s. So it was a time of, you know, I was making a lot of photographs. I love making pictures. And so that's something that, you know, I'm showing you a lot of pictures today and that's because my practice really stems from that. I like going out in the world, looking at the world, things that interest me and making a lot of pictures. So um, this series is um, of the California farm workers and the farm workers were then organizing for the right to vote for the union of their choice. So this is 
clearly one of the pictures I made in the fields. This is the Salinas Valley in California. So in 1974, my brother was in love with a young woman who was volunteering at the headquarters of the United Farmworkers Union in La Paz, a small enclave in the Tehachapi Mountains southeast of Bakersfield. I followed one weekend and for a year or so, I rarely returned to art school in San Francisco. I photographed up and down the valleys of California, the young men living in labor camps, in chicken coops and under the sky, and the children and adults working together in the fields. And the UFW, United Farm Worker, organizers and volunteers, listening and talking with farm workers about how the right to vote for the union of their choice might change their lives. So in this picture, uh, Chewy, Chewy Solano is in the foreground. He's actually, and I'm pointing to him, which you guys can't tell I'm doing that, but he's actually in the white t-shirt. He's, his back is to the camera. So UFW organizers, Celestino, Ricardo, Rosa, and Chewy often included me in their daily rounds. They felt it was important, really important to have somebody documenting what they were doing. Um, so their daily rounds were from the fields and the camps to Maria's kitchen table. She was somebody that often cooked for us. These are two lechigueros, uh, they're lettuce workers. And most of these pictures are just about the organizing of the farm workers to um, take seriously their, the fact that they were gonna be able to vote for a union and the UFW was hoping that they'd be voting for them. Prior to this time, farm workers did not have the right to vote for a union of their choice the growers would select the union if there was, if there was union uh, representation in a particular uh, company. So something that I did that I look back now and find interesting is that at the time when I was making these pictures, I just wanted to, sh you know, there wasn't much happening besides people listening and talking. And so I was trying to, you know, put three or four pictures on a, on a photo page as I was printing, which was, really hard to do, you know, I just, I couldn't figure out how to do it, but obviously I did figure out how to do it since I have um, quite a few vintage prints like this that I find now perhaps more interesting than I did back when I made them. And they're kind of like little film strips. This is again, another lettuce worker. This is Ricardo Villapondo. He's one of the main people who would take me around with him as he was going through his daily rounds. And this is probably around four o'clock in the morning. He's on a bus as the workers are heading to the fields. This is uh, again, Ricardo Villapondo at a labor camp talking with workers. He was a lettuce cutter himself back in the earlier days before he was a union organizer. This is Cesar Chavez, you may have heard of him. He was the head of the UFW at the time. Um, and uh, this is him talking to uh, farm workers. This is again, Cesar Chavez, he's in the lower right-hand corner. I was telling you about how I was printing pictures to show you know, really the sequence of how things happened. And here he is talking to um, men at the labor camp, again, about this new law that was going to come into effect and the importance of voting for, for the union. This is a house meeting, again, still organizing for the union elections. This is um, Celestino Rivas, and he was also one of the main people who'd take me around. This is day 60 of organizing. And this is a portrait of day 60 of organizing. Day in and day out. And it was, you know, it was tough work that they were doing. You know, it'd be 12, 14, 14 hour days, maybe even longer. No, actually probably longer because they start early in the morning and go through the evening, late night meetings at the union hall. And this is a union hall meeting. And again, most of these pictures that I have of the farm workers are from the Salinas Valley, which is about two hours south of San Francisco. This is a little bit further south in Oxnard, California, and these women are listening to Cesar Chavez talk. I was always much better uh, taking pictures of the crowd than I was of taking pictures like of Cesar talking 
I didn't know how to make pictures of that that were particularly interesting. Uh, meaning that, you know, somebody up on a podium speaking through a microphone, just I didn't know how to make those pictures. And I didn't, I didn't use a long lens. So I was much more interested in those things that, um, you know, that I could get closer to, people I could get closer to. And I was much more interested in photographing the farm workers than I was in photographing the leadership of the UFW. So that was something that I find that I really like that approach now that I look at it. I don't know, you know, at the time I just did it sort of intuitively. Now I really appreciate that I did do it that way. This is Rosa Saucedo talking with a farm worker uh, at a labor camp. This is uh, same, same, uh, still working with UFW. This is down in Oxnard. And this is a strawberry field in Oxnard. Um, Driscoll, if you're familiar with Driscoll, I don't know if Driscoll strawberries make it back east, but we certainly have that company still here in California. And uh, the police are guarding the field so that the United Farm Worker organizers couldn't enter and talk to the workers in the field about the upcoming elections. And this is a helicopter, police helicopter, keeping the UFW out of the fields. Uh, another way of organizing that they had at that time was um, marching. And Cesar Chavez would organize these marches throughout California. And this one in 1975 um, was a thousand mile march. And here's the march going through the Salinas Valley. And these are people on the side of the road watching the march. Uh, a couple watching the march. This is another march. This march is through East Oakland. Um, this wasn't the Thousand Mile March, it was a march on Gallo. And this was a protest in Modesto, the city of Modesto. Um, the city had not granted the, the United Farm Workers the right to uh, march through the city. So they protested at the courthouse. On June 5th, 1975, the California Agricultural Labor Relations Act became law allowing farm workers the right to vote for union representation. So this was the culmination of all that summer activity. I was 20 and 21 years old and I knew it was an enormous privilege to have been able to make these pictures. So these are just a few miscellaneous pictures from that same series. This is Maria. I would spend hours with Maria. She would tell me stories about her life. We both were smokers. This is, uh, you know, just again, four pictures up of men in the union hall, just talking, talking about their, you know, what's going on in their lives, what's going on with their companies. And here I am at Maria's kitchen table. And here I am with Ricardo and Celestino. Hate to say it, cigarette in hand. Although I no longer smoke, so I'm not promoting smoking, just so you know. Um, so that was 1975. I did make pictures in between the previous series and what I'm gonna show you now. But again, I have so much work that I have to sort of pick and choose what I show in a personal history. And now we've jumped, we're jumping up to like the mid eighties and well, sort of the early, early to mid eighties. Did I stop anything? I'm still screen sharing. Okay. Um, the early, so, so these pictures are from what I call dark days, landfall and the city. And basically all, the, all of those three entities, those three categories are the same. There are pictures that I made in the eighties in response to uh, how I felt about you know, that time. Um, the early 1980s encapsulated for me the anxieties of a world spinning out of balance. 
global warming, civil wars in the Middle East and Central America, and the election of a former movie actor, Ronald Reagan, to the presidency of the United States, all contributed for me the sense of no future. If you think about the punk movement, movement at that time, that's kind of, I think, the mantra of, of that movement, and I understood that. And um, although I wasn't, I wouldn't say that I was really part of that, that movement, I, I felt a lot of empathy. Um, when I returned at 32 to the San Francisco Art Institute in 1984 to attend graduate school, I worked closely with teacher and mentor Larry Sultan. I think Larry wasn't quite engaged with my photography because he and I both wondered what is to be done. How does one photograph what it feels to like, to, <clears throat> excuse me, feels like to live in this particular moment in history? Particularly, how does one photograph a fear and anxiety of what might happen in the future? Dark Days, the city and the book Landfall came from this desire to visualize the despair and disillusionment that I was feeling, an expression of a world turned upside down. Larry's curiosity and interest helped to fuel and maintain the project while I was in grad school. Some of my earliest pictures in this series were of the landscape, a pier fire in San Francisco, a collapsed road, a bay cove filled with tires, cars and junks forays into the Western deserts, looking for man-made scars and refuse, refuge, refuse, signs of a collapsing civilization. Up the street from where I lived, there were the remains of a house fire. Inside the house, I found a burnt world globe, burnt dishes, and a burnt telephone book. In the basement, I found the charred snapshots of an unknown family. In a bedroom, I found a burnt dresser and burnt lamp. Years later, the burnt lamp reminded me of when I was nine years old during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1963. My mother told me there might be a nuclear war. For a period of time, I'd wake up in the middle of the night, repeatedly look at the hallway clock and worried about not sleeping. And at school, my classmates and I practiced getting under our desks. As I continued the project over a period of six years, I added pictures of both friends and strangers, often in odd and disquieting poses seeking to describe the sense of discomfort I saw both in myself and in my community. So, um, Landfall is a book of my 1980s photographs that was published in 2018 by TBW Books. It's a dreamlike sequence of images of an American dystopia. Um, and again, I'm going to show you the book like I showed you um, The White Sky, just because the way that it's put together, I think is, you know, it, it just really kind of, um, I don't know, it gives you the feeling of what I was feeling at that time. And um, I think the sequencing that was done lot of, largely owed to TBW um, is, is worth presenting and seeing in its entirety. So I take out a few pictures, but, and I'll go through this fairly quickly. So this is the, the front cover of the book. And actually the titling came from um, Alice in Wonderland. And this is the back cover of the book. Here's the publisher's description of Landfall. 
Oh, wait, I'm not gonna read that quite yet. Let me go back to this one. So again, I'm showing you um, the book almost in its entirety. So it goes from this picture to this piece of writing. I remember having insomnia for a time when I was nine years old. My mother told me there might be nuclear war. I spent many nights getting out of bed to look at the hallway clock. Late into the night, I also worried about not sleeping. So again, here's the publisher's description of the book. Created from images taken during the 1980s, Plum's landfall encapsulates the anxieties of a world spinning out of balance, a mirror land eerily reminiscent of our own time. The burnt out remains of a house fire open on to an equally decimated alpine landscape. Group shots of humans in lack lackadaisical embrace with high-tech weapons of war. Plum's photographs of man-made scars and refuse mingle in seductive rhythm with portraits of friends and strangers in disquieting poses, reveling in the underlying unease the artist saw in herself, her community, and the world at large. And now I'm not going to actually say too much as I as I scroll through these images from the book. I will say that again, almost all these images are from the Western United States mostly California, but also some, some states surrounding California, some states east and north. This is my brother-in-law. This is my um, husband at the time. He and I are still very good friends. I'm incredibly, incredibly grateful to both Stanley Barker and TBW Books um, for their ability to edit and sequence the work. It's not that I didn't have anything to do with it, but um, I think, you know, I've heard Steidel talk about the fact that it takes an orchestra to create a book. And I think that that's really true. I tried uh, various drafts of this work um, throughout the years, but I didn't come to anything that was really quite, quite worked for me that was very satisfying. And um, I think landfall really does, you know, uh, in, in a group of images really pull together, I think exactly what I was trying to say in this, in this series. You know, again, I think putting together landscapes with these portraits of, of people, that was really the trick. I didn't, I didn't quite know how to do that on my own.
This is actually my mother. And these are the last few images in the book. Um, this is the last image in the book. And this is a self-portrait that I made when I was making this work. So uh, I still have a little bit more to show you and then we'll, we'll kind of, we'll get to the end of this presentation. Um, after making the images from the 1980s, I found myself asking what is worth preserving? What's worth embracing? And for me, it was horses, the line of their backs, the wind in their manes, the magical light of the late afternoon sky. So in the 1990s, I spent many summers in the high Sierra Nevada and reconnected with a childhood passion of horseback riding. I fell in love with a herd of horses living summer months in an idyllic meadow near to Kings Canyon National Park in California. I watched them follow the herd in their daily cycle for days on end, enamored with the utopian vision that stood in stark contrast to the dystopian Western landscape depicted in, in dark days. Horses sleep lying down, just so you know, these are sleeping horses. A close up of a sleeping horse. This isn't this entire series, I'm just giving you a a sense of something that I moved on to after doing Dark Days, Dark Days Landfall. It's an extreme close up. And an extreme close up, very extreme close up. And that's the last picture I'm showing you. All this work takes you up to the early 2000s. And, you know, I consider all the photographs I've made after then to be works in progress, which is really why I don't show that work at this time. So that's it. Well, thank you so much, Mimi. That was fantastic. And this is the part where you should be enjoying your thunderous applause <laughs> right now, but because of the virtual world. Uh, I see you, Ross. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and for all of you who are, are with us, again, please feel free to post questions. Um, in the Q and A, and um, I'll do my best to get to all of them. Um, so, where should we start? I think. Um, so, I'll just kind of go through with these in order to some extent. Um, the The first question that was posted is from Jack McKinney, who is asking about any cinematic references um, that may have influenced your work, as he noticed, or he felt there was a. They see that your images seemed cinematic to him. You know, I, I I totally agree, and I I work so intuitively, and I I don't mean to not answer the question. I do think of my work as being very cinematic. I'm, get, I'm told that a lot too. Um, I've watched movies since I was a kid. I can't think of anything in particular that influenced me to shoot in that way. It just just happens to be the way that I see. If I can be so, I don't know simplistic about it. Or maybe the, the cinematic references are all referencing your photographs. <laughs> I like that. That's yeah. good. Um, so Dawood Bey is asking, um, well, I, I'll read it verbatim. Um, okay. So this is quoting from Dawood's question. I'm curious over several decades of making pictures, what has provoked the use of different kinds of cameras? 
whether 35 millimeter, medium format, or large format, or square format. Yeah. What does a shift in the tool do for you in relation to the pictures themselves? So the 70s really for me, um, and maybe this was obvious to, to Dawood in looking at the work, it was all 35 millimeter. And that's, you know, that was what I was introduced to. That's what people were using back in the 70s. You know, it was sort of the time of Robert Frank and Gary Winogrand and that that crew of people. And so Hank Wessel was at the Art Institute at that time. And, um, you know, there were people using the four by five, but that tended to be those people who, who came out of the 50s, you know, a different decade from me. Those were the older people. So yeah, the young people were generally using like a 35 millimeter camera. The thing about the 35 millimeter for me that I think was fantastic and I think definitely affects the kind of pictures I was able to make is that you could shoot so quickly and so intuitively and that really fit uh, the way I liked shooting. I mean, the thing I loved about making pictures is I should, I could do stuff so quickly. It, it's like I didn't, when I, when I tried to write poetry back in high school, I just agonized over every word and I could never find the right words. But when I was shooting, I just like, you know, it was like, I, I, you know, I made one picture after another without really thinking about it, agonizing about it. And the 35 millimeter camera is made for that kind of shooting. It just, you know, you can zone focus the camera, pre-focus it. Um, I, it's a much quicker than I think the digital cameras, which always seem to have a delay when you're shooting. Um, so the 35 millimeter camera with, you know, I used a 35 millimeter lens on it most of the time, pre-focused, I could, you know, just respond to actually what was happening in the moment. And um, the thing that the drawback of it is that the quality is not as fine as you get when you use a larger format camera. And the work isn't maybe as considered. It's a different kind of work that you get with 35 than you do with a larger format camera. I tried a four by five, maybe somewhere after that time period. And I just didn't get it at all. It just didn't, you know, it just didn't work for me. I didn't have the patience. You know, honestly, I don't think I had the patience for it. So, you know, all this stuff is reflective of who you are. Um, so in the eighties, there was this camera, the Plabell Makina, which is a six, seven, um, two and a quarter, two and three quarters. And it had a bellows, and so it wasn't that heavy, but you pull out the bellows, and, and it was kind of like a gigantic Leica, although it wasn't as quick. I mean, I think I lost a certain spontaneity in my photographs in the 80s, but what I did gain is just this fantastic detail. You know, the description was something that I reveled, I just, you know, fell in love with. Uh, the description both, you know, in the landscapes, I think it worked terribly well with the landscapes. With the people, you know, I just was kind of like hit and miss. I'd always hoped to get the picture, but uh, I was still trying to shoot like it was 35, but it wasn't. And then I'd have that flash attached. And that's part of why I have these weird shadows happening is that the flash would just sort of be falling all over the place. And I used that to my advantage after a certain point when I realized what was happening. I'm giving a very lengthy answer here, but, but you know, it does really affect what you do, you know, the choices that you make. So, um, after that, I was pretty hooked on using a, a medium format camera. And so when I went to do the horses, uh, the, the, uh, the six, seven, I just wasn't happy with. I thought even though horses, you know, don't really fit in the square, there was something kind of precious about using the square that fit for me. Mm -hmm. And also I had gotten a grant. So I got this lens where I could focus really close. Like that eye, I was like two inches from the horse. Mm -hmm. I made that picture three inches. So it was on a rolly and you can get this incredible lens that would allow you to focus really, really close. And so that's, that's what was happening in that work. Um, I'm back to using the six, seven. I'd love to use a 35 millimeter again, because God, you know, I just would love to be able to make those kinds of pictures that are really, again, really playful, very quick, but um, I can't let go of that quality that you get with the larger format. So. Great. Did that answer the question? I think so. I, yeah, that was great. I think that, that's fantastic. Um, a current, one of our current graduate students, Jessica Hayes, is um, asking about the photographs in white sky and wondering if you, um, if you were thinking about uh, climate, climate change, the climate crisis, or unsustainability of suburbia, 
Um, or was that something that that became clear later as those topics became much more mainstream? Yeah, you know, um, it's, first of all, I don't think that was my impetus for making the work. Although what I felt about growing up in suburbia was just the inhospitable landscape, the harshness of the landscape. And so that was something I really wanted to describe, which I think speaks to, you know, what California is, which is this land of smoke and fire. And, um, but in terms of climate change, you know, I did when I was making that work, live through that drought in the seventies. And so that was like, you know, wake up call. This is, this is pretty scary what's happening, but I wasn't thinking about it as being something that, you know, was affecting us worldwide, I think. It wasn't until the early 80s until that really, really became maybe just absolutely paramount to me and, and really at the forefront of my thinking is that worry about what we were doing to the environment. And actually politically, if we had the will to address it, and I think we're still facing the same questions today because you know, I think basically it's a question of economics and making changes and how we, you know, how, how we uh, live and uh, the kind of economy that we create. And um, I think it's something that was dire back then and that's dire now. So I was much more aware of it in the eighties than I was in the seventies. Mm -hmm. um, Jesse Brown is asking um, about your time studying with Larry Salton and um, during the time you were making the work for Landfall, if you were influenced at all by evidence or by Salton's thoughts on ambiguity in photography? Yeah, I'm not sure how... <sighs> okay, I'm, this is how I'm gonna answer it. Um, I mean, I remember seeing evidence at the time, so I think for sure it had an impact. It's also now when I look at my work, particularly from the 70s and I see Hank Wessel, I had no idea that I had like Hank Wessel running through all of my work. Um, so, so with Larry, of course, you know, there was, he, he, he was working on his family photographs then, which was an entirely different sort of thing to be doing than what I was doing. Um, and we'd have conversations about that because, you know, he thought it was really brave that I was taking on these political issues. And uh, I think it was really brave he was taking on these family issues, but uh, that's an aside. I think one of the things that I remember most about Larry affecting what I did is when I was photographing the landscape, we were talking about the fact that the work was still rather cool. It seemed somewhat detached, even though, you know, I was photographing these scenes like that collapsing road and stuff. There was just, you know, it was still more an, of an intellectual approach. And um, I think Larry, definitely affected me to, or had the, an influence on me starting to look at the people who surrounded me. How could I get that real sense of anxiety that I was feeling into the work? And I think that came about from photographing people. And I think Larry had a big impact on that, big influence on that, I should say. Yeah, and I think I'm gonna jump ahead to a question that Kelly Connell's asking, because I think it might be slightly related. Um, but she, Kelly's asking about um, your experience with publishers and calling out your previous statement about how you said that you have had really positive experiences working with publishers and how they've sort of sequenced or edited your work. And um, she's asking if you could talk a little bit more about working on the final edit for Landfall and if you suggested the text elements in the book or if that was the publisher's idea. So, um, you know, we were trying to, Paul, Paul, there's Paul Schick and, and Lester Rosso working at TBW. And they were both, they were both involved with the making of Landfall. And, you know, they were presented, I mean, I have so much work from back then, a lot that, you know, I don't have posted too. So I don't know how many pictures they had, but the way that, well, Paul saw my work, um, he saw a few images, a few vintage images, was really an, interested in the work. And then a couple of years later approached me about doing a book of it. Um, and I sent them, you know, hundreds of pictures. So I don't know that that's the case with everybody that they work with, that there's that much work um, that they 
can be looking at and trying to incorporate into a, you know, a sequence that makes sense. But, you know, basically they were really enamored with it, with the work, but they didn't know how to put it together. And I didn't know how to put it together. So, so we're both sort of in the same spot, but these guys are better at sequencing than I am. So, uh, and then also, you know, I can't edit my work. I just, you know, I fall in love with certain images. I don't want to let go of them. It's like, no, I want that picture in there. And, and so my, my edits were like too many pictures and it was kind of flat. I didn't know how to sequence where there was like kind of a, a narrative or an arc to, to the sequence uh, that would sort of pull you through uh, the book. Um, I don't know that I'm describing that that well, but um, what happened is that maybe a few months into it as we were really tr trying to figure out how to do this, Lester came up with a sequence. He took the work home and just worked on it on his own. And he had that piece of writing of mine and he pulled out those sentences and he started sequencing the work coming off of those sentences about, um, you know, what my mother told me about nuclear or what my mother telling me about nuclear war and my reaction to it. And as soon as that happened, the work fell into place. And then we all, we all had a, an effect on which pictures, you know, Lester had his edit, uh, which I thought I saw that it was like the bare bones of this book. And it was like, okay, this is exciting. This actually is, I think, possibly going to work. And I think they felt the same way too. And then it was just a matter of just adding pictures, subtracting pictures, me trying to get pictures in that I really loved, them trying to, you know, keep certain pictures. Um, and then that very ending of the book is something I think that Paul was really felt really strongly about, which is just, you know, you sort of end up, you know, it's an abrupt end. And I had some misgivings about it, but I think it's really, I think it's really kind of wonderful the way that it ends now. I think so. I mean, it's bleak, but mm. very powerful. So um, there's sort of things that all of us brought something to it. I think that I, I can't remember what Kelly exactly. Yeah, asked, you, you answered it. Yeah. Uh, so th we, there's still a number of really great questions. I think we have time for a few more. Um, I just want to let everybody know that if I don't, if I don't get to your question, it's, it's not personal. Um, we, we're on, we're on a time, time limit tonight. So um, you know, I'll continue asking them. And I think, like I said, I think we can get, get through a couple more. Um, Doug Dubois is asking um, about how- Doug. Doug was in grad school with me. Well, he's in your lecture with you tonight too. <laughs> well, so maybe we should have Doug speak about what was going on back then. Sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. Anyway, sorry, Doug, what's, what's, your, what's the question? So he's asking about um, taking your time, revisiting images, uh, letting images percolate over time and how that informs your process of understanding of your work. I'm just thinking about, it. I mean, what I think about in relationship to it is that I just didn't really have the opportunity to do something with it sooner than, than, than um, you know, when it, I, it, I think, gosh, I'm going to say two things. One is that I did want to walk away from the work in the eighties. I, I was just sort of, just couldn't deal with it. So that that was a period of time when I couldn't deal with it. But then after that, it was hard to get people to pay attention. And I think, you know, Paul paying attention to the work, um, you know, a few years ago, the, the uh, work from Landfall, um, you know, just made it so, I, I think what happened is that what I was looking at in the eighties really does mimic what's going on today, unfortunately. And so that allowed Paul and Lester to, you know, see this work and, and think, God, you know, this, this is really pertinent and relevant to what's going on. It's not just an historical archive. I don't know if it changes what I saw and felt. I think it just, it just, unfortunately it showed that, you know, what I was looking at back in the eighties, you know, was never resolved and never solved. And that's unfortunately the truth of it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, throughout your whole presentation, and, and this is me, not someone else asking a question, yeah. but throughout your whole presentation, I, I kept thinking about how it, it's, it just seemed like foreshadowing. It just seemed like, yeah. you know, as I'm looking at these images of things that were happening 20, 30, 40 years ago, uh, they're all happening again. So it, yeah. it, it's an interesting thing to see all of these things coming around again. I mean, uh, that's why I think the work was paid attention to, um, you know, the past several years and it makes sense. And I was ready, I think also to deal with it. Maybe that's it. 
Right. I mean, this this work I did in the 80s really, you know, it's it's psychologically, it's not just that I felt that, it's just that it also was just overwhelming. I mean, making the pictures just, you know, left me kind of like unable to walk, you know, walk away from this sense of, you know, the sense of possibly no future. And I needed uh, some space to breathe and live my life and all of that. Well, and on that note, um, uh, Daniel, and I, I'm not, I'm sorry, Daniel, I'm not going to try to pronounce your last name um, for fear of butchering it, but he's asking about your mindset with shifting your focus um, to photographing horses. Um, and he said, it looks like your arc started with some form of dystopia and ended with some sort of peace. Well, yeah, up to the horse. Yes, I think that that's, I don't even know if it's, yeah. I think that that's that's true. I mean, that's that's something I I wanted to see actually if I could make pictures that that um, not just make pictures, but if I could, yeah, if I could make pictures of things that I loved, that was the challenge. And you know what? It's really hard to do, and I'm not quite sure that I succeeded, but um, that was the challenge that I set up for myself. And it was such a pleasure to spend day after day with these horses. I certainly learned I'm not a wildlife photographer, but I did the best I could. <laughs> with... I, I mean, I'm, I'm this image that is still up on the screen. I, I, you know, I, it, it's, it's hypnotizing. So it's, it's an interesting shift for sure. Thanks. Um, Jessica Foley is asking um, if you have a draw to the center of the frame. Um, she, you know, she notes that uh, from her point of view, a lot of your subjects are positioned in the middle of your field, both vertically and horizontally. And she's asking if that's uh, if that's about being direct. You know, I, it's not intentional. And I do know that I do that it makes me crazy. It's like, why do I do that? But then if I don't do it, it makes me crazy. It's like I want to crop the picture so that it, so that it does look that way I don't know it's just the way that I see and I think that I am sort of blunt and direct in life so so maybe that's that's why I do that um I've been told you're not supposed to do that <laughs> I, I read the manuals where you know that's just not the right way <laughs> not the right way to make an image so that's worked for you you know you you do what you what you know I think all this work ultimately probably the the strength of it is that it, it reflects who I am and you can't get away from that ultimately when you're making work. Yeah. So, um, so I, I'm going to ask this this last question from an anonymous attendee um, who's asking, and, and and the reason I'm picking this image is because I was actually texting with um, with Kristen, who is a co-moderator of this tonight about black and white. And um, this this question is specifically if you could talk a little bit about your relationship to black and white photography. Um, you know, I was raised with it. So let me, let me start there. And it's what I knew and understood. And there is a certain abstraction to it that, um, that can be really useful, I think, in, in, in making images. But I have been shooting since when, for the past maybe 10 to 15 years in color also shooting some in black and white, but then, you know, I start switching it into black and white and then I go back to color and I'm actually quite in love with color also, but I don't have a command of it. And so that makes it hard to work with. And what I mean by that, having a command of it, I think that I see color, I know what color I want. I don't technically have a, a good command of it. And that makes it hard for me to work in color. Mm -hmm. um, um, so black and white, I'm comfortable working in, you know, I know how I want it to look and, and it does abstract things at times and it can, and it can really help the images, but also at times I really miss having, having the color that I've been seeing in the work the past 10 to 15 years. So I don't know, I go back and forth right now as to, you know, where I am with that. But I think, you know, I started out in, in black and white and worked in black and white because I knew it and understood it more than anything else. Oh, wait, no, there's something else I should add to that. I did start Dark Days in color. Oh. And boy, the blue skies were just like, particularly, I mean, the California blue skies, that's all you get. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, no, this is not 
what I want to be photographing. This is not the way I want it to look. It did not work at all. So maybe that really does particularly address the question that she asked. Um, yeah, I, I, that's that's a really interesting. I'm really glad you added that last part. Yeah. I lived in Southern California for nine months and it's it's not a very long time, but the with that the way the sky glows in Southern California is permanently burned into my brain. It's a very uh -huh. different kind of sky. Uh -huh. Um, so I think um, I, I'm looking through the chat and the Q&A, and I think I have asked at least a version of everyone's question. Um, so uh, if, I, if I missed you out there, I apologize. Um, but Mimi, I just wanted to say just a huge thank you. This was a really fantastic uh, way to spend, um, to spend an evening to hear you talking about your, your career and your work um, and seeing how your, your, your work is relevant today just as it was 30 years ago. Um, so thank you so much. Again, this is, you should be hearing thunderous applause right now. I'm sure it's happening all over the country in, 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 uh, in front of computers, but um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you to everybody out there who joined us tonight. Um, what a great way to end the lectures and photography series for the fall semester. And I hope all of you will tune in again next semester. Um, uh, for uh, for the, the series of three lectures next semester. So Mimi, thank you again. Okay. Um, and thank you to everyone for coming tonight. I wanna thank everybody too. Thank you all for coming and um, thank you Columbia and the MOCP. I really, I enjoyed it. I thought it would just feel like I was talking to myself which at times felt a little bit like that but um, yeah, I'm really glad to be doing this. So thank you. Great. Well, good night, everyone. And uh, again, thanks to our lecture and thanks to everyone for coming. So long. Bye.